I'm here to make a revolution tonight. Anyone got one of these? One of these devices? Can you just hold it up in the air? And this is everyone on the live stream as well. Uh, I thought it'd be quite uh, fitting to actually do a declaration of digital independence, bringing all the different part of people who are watching at home across the globe together as one digital citizenship, one global superpower that gives us the opportunity to change the world. And what I'm so excited about and I'm going to be talking about today is around cognitive learning. Uh, I think it's such an exciting opportunity where we're going into a new era, a new era of intelligence. And I'm going to start off with a bit of history. Obviously, that mentioned just before was the 1776. And I was, I was lucky enough to have a bit of a tour as a journey to my TEDx experience to go and see where the Declaration of Independence was signed. Uh, and also go to Washington, D.C. and see the big man himself, um, Abraham Lincoln. So, you know, part of it is he started on this path for the first revolution, the industrial steam-powered uh, industry. Now, what I wanted to do is I wanted to take you all back a little bit further into history. Uh, and if you've not noticed already, uh, I've come from the other side of the pond. Uh, and I live just a few miles away from a, a tiny place uh, called Bletchley Park. So you may have noticed this. It's one of the, the f last five working uh, uh, enigmas. Uh, and they were the gentleman who I know, because I've done some work for uh, in, the, in the UK government, uh, opened it up and, and managed to turn it over to Ted. Now, I think as human beings, uh, and obviously we're talking about Turing here for a second, we're fantastic at solving complex problems. And what Turing did and how many years he took off the war and how many people he saved just kind of shows the compassion, what the humans can do. And this is why I think together with technology, we can do, accomplish great things. Um, I've just spent the last year uh, out in Silicon Valley um, working with some large organizations that manufacture mobile phones on their machine learning platforms. Uh, I've been helping them predict where potential failures are when, when people are going to be coming in to get their, their screens chase, uh, changed or you know, some other issue problems with recent uh, releases. And you know, this kind of technology isn't just limited to the valley. Uh, but you know, part of it, where it was born back in Silicon Valley, you know, Hewlett and Packard in the garage behind us in 1939 looked at actually starting to build out engineering, in this case, hardware. And they were going through a very sequential uh, design, um, build, test, and then deliver the product at the end. This is kind of known within the industry as, as waterfall, sequential uh, design. Uh, and you know, Hewlett and Packard then got to the point where they released, they were going to iterate Mark I, Mark II, get better at what they were doing. And what they did is they started iterating around the build and test, build and test. And this is back in 1939, way before the Agile Manifesto. And you know, to me, what I, the significance of this is, is that none of this is new. And we move on back to, to Bletchley on, on my, just uh, last week before my flight out. I was lucky enough to see uh, Alan Turing's um, uh, first works on artificial intelligence in 1950. We've just, you know, that's the same time around the singularity and, and some of the papers that were published around there. There was a huge movement around artificial intelligence. Uh, what I'm so excited about now is, you know, some of you have probably already seen uh, that uh, the first ever robot uh, citizen uh, was, was made in Saudi Arabia. And you know, what's fantastic about this little clip, what's going through, is that she's actually, been, now she's got a passport, she's flown over to Germany, sat with another AI-based system, and she's critiquing the autonomous car as, as it drives. So I think this is it, it just absolutely fa fascinating and how we're going to get into that point where we're learning. So what I wanted to quickly do is I wanted to kind of put a bit of a proposal towards how I think we're going to interact with AI to help us uh, harmonize or even transcendence between our skills and what makes us very unique as humans around how we deal with problems. I'm going to start off with the think aspect. 
this seems like a perfectly great candidate for, for AI. Uh, and for those guys who have had experience with the first wave, this was kind of programmable logic. This was people teaching the system to be able to play, say, for instance, chess, big blue. And I think the other aspect, which you'll have probably heard quite a lot also in this kind of innovation and technology area, is the learning aspect. And this seemed like a fantastic opportunity to apply some of that machine learning, neural nets, applying huge amounts of data to look at patterns, make predictions, predictions around what could possibly happen. So we've just found two perfect candidates to take some of the heavy lifting of the design and the learning aspects at both ends of that development cycle. Where do we come in? Well, I think we come into this area here where we have to evolve the, the logic. This could be models, this could be data, this could be creating stuff, what we're very good at. And I'm going to actually be talking to you at the end about how we play a part in this new future and that we shouldn't be worried about the fact that robots are going to take 50% of our jobs, as uh, Oxford University mentioned, but actually more around the opportunity for us to start learning some of these great digital skills that are going to help us go through. Now, I might have mentioned already that my role day to day is helping uh, and traveling around the world talking as a digital therapist. So some of the technology behind here is things that I work with on a daily basis and I think is incredibly exciting. Uh, I've had the pleasure of being able to do work across the globe uh, for things like smart city projects. Uh, I, did, I helped with the, a Copenhagen smart city project to help them become carbon neutral by 2020. I had the pleasure of uh, going over to Brisbane uh, in Australia and their new super campus, biggest health campus on the planet, uh, in, a, in a, a new virtual city that's going to then become a huge uh, metropolis called Springfield. Uh, I also had the opportunity to go over uh, and work on some of predictive crime technology across Washington DC state, which is uh, one of the reasons that's brought me back over here, but also uh, for GCHQ in the UK and some other estab establishments uh, across the globe, predicting when crime's gonna happen. So this is taking huge amounts of data, applying algorithms and machine learning to, and then video analytics to kind of say, well, actually these people are loitering or they are, maybe they stop in the car or they're seeing some kind of pattern or they're looking over in a restricted area. We're detecting that area and actually be able to understand historical information to predict where the best location for emergency services and police. You know, this is a technology that's already here today. It does very much sound like Minority Report. And as things grow and these IoT, these uh, new technologies come through and cryptocurrency and blockchain, it seems like the opportunities are endless. But how do we apply the, this, this new technology? And part of what I'm trying to say with this, this particular session is that I don't believe it is a revolution. I actually think it's more of an evolution. And it's, it's us harmonizing with the technologies that are available today and understanding ourselves and our digital blueprint. So that could be our DNA, what makes us unique, and understand how and what we have to give and what skills and what opportunities we have that can move us into different areas. And at the end, I'm going to actually show a slide what came up quite recently around where they predict that most of the jobs will go, uh, disappear. And it's quite interesting to see because, as you'd expect, some of the more painful uh, industries, such as legal, uh, will, will, will be a, a prime candidate for this kind of stuff. So part of it is, I don't think we have to fear this. I actually think we need to embrace this kind of technology. And it may seem like this technology that's going on behind me is something that's set in the future and can no way possibly uh, be real. But you know, I have I've had opportunities to do things like car to X. So this is the ability for cars to talk to infrastructure, infrastructure to X, which is the uh, uh, is traffic systems talking to bit smart buildings, to car parks, to smart toll roads. Connecting all that inf information becomes a, a massive opportunity. So this is whole uh, smart city data exchanges where people can put information to share information to make their city a, a better place. Uh, you'll have heard of things like uh, the new autonomous uh, watch, which you can uh, get an autonomous vehicle to come and pick you up. 
you know, part of it is these technologies are here. I was actually in, on the, uh, in Singapore on that exact same building, and the technology that the Singapore government are using is unbelievable. They're really embracing their five-year plan or their 2020 plan of what uh, the city of the future should look like. I think we all have a part to play in this new digital uh, you know, uh, life and become a digital citizen, which doesn't mean that we have to be based by location. We know that t most of 60% of the population are going to live in those big super cities. You know, we need to start preparing for how do we actually work and live in these kind of environments. So I'm extremely excited about this, and I think you've got to ask yourself now, is, you know, do you think this, your, your job's at a threat? Or do you think this is your opportunity to understand and become a digital native in comparison to being digitally disengaged uh, or even you know, frightened of what potentially could happen if you start moving in a direction that could potentially mean that that repetition that you do, that digital grind, which takes so much of your time every day, checking phone, making sure there is your notifications, responding to email, all that will go. My prediction is that by 2020, there'll be no more apps. Software is dead, but I don't think software ever was alive in the first place. It's not self-aware. It doesn't learn. And the technology that's now on these devices you, has now actually got machine learning built into these devices. So we need to make our experience, because we're unique, not just everyone in this entire, uh, auto, uh, using the same applications in the same way. I think our digital experiences are unique, and that's why we have a place in this future. And at the same time, you may be looking at this future thinking, how on earth am I going to interact with it? All this new flood of information, all these endpoints or that I'm going to have to interact, uh, interact with, traffic management systems that are telling me not to cr cross the road. You've got people interactions where you're building relationships with people, maybe digitally and never physically. You know, these are new changes in our, the whole uh, the way that we interact with technology. Now, do we fear this or do we see it for what it is? Is that actually it is that evolution and it's the next iteration where we're actually going to become more involved. We're going to get things are going to be better for us. I, I remember being in, um, in, in Japan and sitting there waiting for the tube and you could scan what you wanted to buy from the, the shops. There was no shop. There was no store. It was just a screen. But by the time you got to your end location, they delivered the fresh produce. So there was no expensive uh, retail outlet. You, know, you didn't have to go out of your way to get that. You could do that on your journey back. Multi-reality AR, VR is going to be this opportunity to actually not have to do some of those painful things that eat into our time. So like I said, I'm going to go back from to, to the last slide and I'm going to say, you know, where do you find yourself in this new future? Do you think you're going to be one of these people that potentially going to be rep replaceable? Or are you going to take it on yourself to become a digital pioneer? Thank you.